Good morning and welcome to the Whaling Museum. This is Multilingual Day, and this presentation is being presented in English and American Sign Language. And with me is Diana Graves, who will be signing the whole presentation. Before we go on our trip today, I want you to think about this. This little island that we're on, no more than 50 square miles of sand, 30 miles out to sea, for over 100 years was the whaling capital of the world. Our whole economy for 100 years was based on one single thing, whaling. So how did that happen? Well, the English came in 1659, and what they had hoped to do was graze sheep and raise crops for cash. If you've spent any time on our island, it's nice and flat, perfect for grazing. We're surrounded by water, so there's no way the sheep can get off the island. We have no predators. That's why there's thousands of rabbit and deer. But we're missing one thing, running water, even though we have some 60 ponds. So there's no way to process wool. As for farming, lots of sandy soil, but not good enough to support an economy built on agriculture. When the English came, there would have been 3,000 Wampanoags living here. And the English went to the Wampanoags, and the Wampanoags told them about a technique they were using called drift whaling. Essentially, what you did is wait till a diseased or dead whale drifted in, and the Wampanoags showed them how to render the blubber, how to use parts of the whale for weapons, for tools. On the upper right-hand side of the screen, that little dome, that's a wee too, and that was the home of the Wampanoags. And we suspect they probably used whalebone to hold it up. So now the English said, well, you know, maybe this is the business we're going to go into, this drift whaling. And this is the whale they were after, one of the nicest, gentlest whales that you can name. It skims along the surface. It's a baleen whale. It eats little urchins and shrimp. Unfortunately, though, it is in dying out unless we do something about it. And they called it the right whale. Simply, it was the right whale to catch. So the English said, you know, maybe this is what we're going to do. We're going to go into this drift whaling. Now, the Wampanoags told them that during the winter, the whales were on the south and east side of the island. A man stays up on a tower looking for the dead or diseased whale. When he sees it, he comes running down. Five other men are around a hut and a fire since it's winter. The six of them pile into a boat, go out, bring back the whale, bring it into town, and process it. So now we've got a real nice business built around that right whale. Except something happened. One of our captains, about 1712, got caught way out to sea farther than he had ever been. And he came across the whale. This wasn't the friendly right whale. This was a huge snub-nosed whale. 60, 70, 80 tons of whale. A fighting whale that could dive thousands of feet into the water. What had he found? One of the greatest creatures on this planet, the giant sperm whale. And when they investigated this whale, they found out it had some very special properties. In that head cavity alone is 300 to 500 gallons of the purest spermaceti oil, so pure that it needs almost no refining. But its most important characteristic is it's the only whale oil that does, does not solidify in cold weather. So for the first time, we could have streetlights around the world. And it made what Jefferson called the perfect candle. Not only was the spermaceti candle the brightest in candles, in fact, if you know the measure of light called candle power, it's based on the spermaceti candle, they were smokeless, dripless, odorless. A huge advancement over animal fat or tallow candles, and the Nantucketers sold them for millions and millions of dollars all over the world. So now the Nantucketers say, those right whales were OK, but we can see where the money was. Except there's one other little problem. 
Sperm blubber goes rancid in six weeks. So you could only go up the coast a little or down the coast before you had to come back to Nantucket to process the oil. So what they do in the 1700s? They invented the triworks, a wood burning fire in the middle of a wooden ship. So now the trips could start to go up to Canada. They could come down to Bermuda. They then, in time, went to South America and up to the Arctic. Then the Nantucketers realized, as early as 1791, that there was huge pods of sperm whales in the Pacific Ocean. So they went around Cape Horn. So the trips that at the beginning would have been three and four months, by the end were three and four years, and we have records of trips that were eight and 11 years, all in pursuit of the sperm whale. On our journey today, we are going aboard the Edward Carey, and we're going with Captain Perry Winslow. And on this trip, Captain Winslow decided to take his wife and young child. It was the privilege of a captain to be able to take his family with him. We have the journals of these women that went out for three or four years. They raised their children aboard a whale ship. And in fact, on this specific trip, Mrs. Winslow had a second child. Also aboard our ship is a young whaler by the name of Joseph Ray. And we're lucky enough to have his journal of this trip to tell us what it was about. He is signed on to be a harpooner on one of our whale boats. And he joins what Melville called the motley crew. These would be Quakers, Wampanoags, escaped slaves, convicts, people from the Azores, the Cape Verde Islands, Africa, Asia, South America. And it's 1854, and the Edward Carey is setting sail. On this trip, Captain Winslow decided to go around Africa into the Pacific Ocean. Young Joseph and the rest of the crew will be in the forecastle in the bow of the ship. It's a 16 by 16 foot area. 20 men will eat down there, sleep down there, do their carving down there. There are animals, there are insects, there are bugs. And there's only one hole that goes up to the deck to give them any air or light. This is another entry from Joseph's journal of this trip. Meanwhile, though, Captain Winslow, his family are in the stern of the ship in what would be considered deluxe accommodations. They might have a cook to prepare their meals, a steward to serve them, and they would have real furniture, such as a bed to sleep in, and probably a sofa and an easy chair. During the day, the men will practice furling and unfurling of the sails. They'll be sharpening the tools needed for whaling. They'll be coiling the ropes for the harpoons. And most importantly, each man will be assigned to a team of five other men. And all day long, they will practice raising and lowering of the whale boats and rowing back and forth and back and forth. So they are ready once the whales have been spotted. Now. Each man, this is a drawing of Joseph's journal again of the ships leaving the harbor. Each man will take a turn up in the crow's nest, 100 feet in the air. There would be two of them up there at the same time. Each with their spyglass is responsible for scanning 180 degrees of the ocean. And what they're looking for is the single blowhole of the sperm whale. So Joseph's up there. He's got his spyglass. He sees a pot of whales. Is it the whales we want? It sure is. Now, Joseph is 100 feet in the air. He has to let the rest of the crew down below know that he has spotted a whale. And what do we think he yells? Who knows? Yep, young man? That's right. There she blows. She blows. And he has to keep yelling it until from down below, they yell back, where at, where at, so he can give them the coordinates. Now, Joseph is going to come running down to join his team. You will notice the last thing they do before getting into this whale boat is take off their shoes. Whales, and especially sperm whales, have very sensitive hearing. 
They were wearing heavy leather shoes, and this is a wooden boat. So what we have to do is sneak up on the whale so it does not know we are coming to kill it. Let's take a look at our whale boat. This is a New Bedford whale boat built in 1900. We do not think that a Nantucket whale boat survives. The difference is it has a hole for a mast and a sail. The New Bedford whalers preferred to sail the dead whale back to the mothership. The Nantucketers thought, why not just row it? Up in the bow is going to be the harpooner, and there's a cutout up there to help him steady himself. He's got two harpoons, the first to get into the whale, the second one, with any luck at all, to also get into the whale to give him a firmer grasp. Each of those harpoons is connected to a rope that runs the length of our whale boat around this loggerhead, and each feeds out of a tub of 1,800 feet of coiled rope. Now, unlike what you see in the movies, harpoons are heavy. They weigh at least six or seven, perhaps even eight pounds. To use it properly, you have to literally be right on top of the whale to get those harpoons in. In the stern of our boat is going to be a mate, an officer, someone who is giving the orders and steering the boat. And then there would be two rowers on each side. And if you look afterwards, even the oar locks are padded, so we make absolutely no noise. So what we're going to do now is ever so quietly sneak up on the whale. And we call it wood, meaning the boat, to black leather, meaning the whale. So Joseph's going to get that first harpoon ready. Again, he has to be right on top of the whale to use it. As soon as he gets that one in, he's going to get the second one ready. And with any luck, we're going to get that one in. And we've caught ourselves a whale. Is the whale dead? No, its blubber is at least 12 inches thick. But the whale knows something happened. It'd be like if you got a mosquito bite or a bee sting or something, it doesn't feel right. You know, something happened, but you're not sure. Now, the whale has two choices. It can sound or go down, but it usually does that for food. What you're counting on is the whale taking the other choice. The only problem with that one is you're connected to it by two harpoons of 1,800 feet the whale can travel a minimum of 10 to 15 miles an hour. Many of those men could not swim, so if you fell out of the boat, you drowned. You had to bucket the water out of the whale boat so it didn't sink, and you had to keep the ropes to the harpoons wet. And you're going to ride around the ocean for however many hours it takes until that whale tires out. One, three, five, or more. Who knows what we call it? Anybody? The Nantucket Slayer Ride. Now, ultimately, the whale is going to tire out. And an interesting thing is going to take place in the middle of the ocean. That officer or mate is going to trade places with the harpooner. Because of his rank, he is given the honor of the kill. But there's a second, more important reason. Remember the whale had that other choice, which was to sound or go down? Up in the starboard side of our whale boat is a hatchet. Should the whale go down, that person has the authority to cut the lines to save the men in the boat, the feeling being there's always going to be another whale coming around. Then, that mate or officer is going to take the tool of his trade, the lance, longer, very pliable, he again has to be right on top of the whale to use it. And if you look up at our sperm whale, right behind this flipper is where his vital organs are. He's going to take that lance. He's going to go at that poor whale until blood comes out of the spout. We yell, there's a chimney fire, and we back off as fast as possible because in its death flurry, the whale could come up underneath the, the boat and 
Nicktopolis. This is a drawing from Joseph's journal of several whales with chimney fires. Now, we have in our hands about a 60-ton dead sperm whale. It's a mammal like we are, so it floats when it's dead. We are going to put a rope around it, and we're going to tow it back to wherever the mothership is. Now, hopefully, the mothership has tried to stay within sight, but given the sleigh ride, the boats could be scattered all over the ocean. The fastest that we can row towing a 60-ton dead sperm whale is one mile an hour. This was not work for weak men. We're going to get the whale to the mothership and put down a flensing platform. You will notice the men have cleats on the bottoms of their shoes. The whale has been bleeding. There are sharks in the water. We can't afford to lose a man. We're going to put a giant hook into the nose of the whale and dangle him off the starboard side and cut what are called blanket pieces. We're going to peel the blubber on that whale like an apple core does in a circular fashion. Each of those blanket pieces would be three to four feet wide, 15 to 20 feet long, a foot thick, and weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds. We're going to use block and tackle to bring them aboard the ship, and then we're going to use mincing and dicing tools to cut them into smaller and smaller pieces. Now, as the smaller pieces were cut, the blubber tended to flap open. The Quaker men were very religious, and when they saw the flapped open blubber, it reminded them of the Bible, so they called those Bible leaves. The next thing we're going to do is bring up the head cavity of the whale. That's where that pure spermaceti oil is. Now, hopefully, the head cavity is big enough we can get our buckets in and get it nice and dry. But sometimes, it's a small head cavity. So what we're going to do is pick the smallest member of the crew, perhaps you young man over there. And we're going to tell you to take off your clothes, and we're going to give you a bucket, and we're going to sink you into the head cavity of the whale. And you get to stay in there until it's nice and dry. Doesn't that sound like fun? Yeah, you can't wait, right? The next thing we're going to do is look in the intestine of the whale for this commodity, which is literally worth as much as gold. If you look at our sperm whale, he's one of the few whales that has teeth but only on the bottom of his jaw. And he doesn't use them for chewing. He uses them for grabbing. And his lunch of preference is the giant squid. And he dives down thousands of feet looking for that giant squid and attempts to grab it and swallow it. It is so far down in the ocean that nobody has ever witnessed it, but sperm whales have been found with suction marks so we know a battle of some type took place. Now, as our whale is digesting that giant squid, sometimes the beak can penetrate his intestine. Our whale actually has the capability to put a covering around that beak to protect himself. And we're looking for this commodity in his intestine. It's known as ambergris or ambergris. Anybody know what it's used for? Perfume. It is the fixident for very fine perfume and considered very lucky if we find it. The next thing we're going to do is put wood underneath the tripods to render the rest of the blubber. As we've been rendering, pieces of skin, pieces of teeth are going to come up to the surface. We're going to take a giant skimming device, kind of a great big version of something you might have in your kitchen. And we are going to skim off that residue. And now we no longer need to put wood underneath the tripods. We're going to feed it that residue. So essentially, the poor whale is now cooking itself. These are the ghostly images that you would see as we go around the clock, rendering all of that blubber and putting it into casks and barrels. The last thing we're going to do is bring up the jawbone of the whale and cut it into pieces. And we're going to give each member of the crew a piece of jawbone, a tooth, or both. 
and in their free time, because it could be weeks between sightings of whales, they will take the teeth and using either shark skin or a file, smooth it and carve into it a design, a picture of a loved one. This was never intended to be an art form. This was literally busy work between whales. Anybody know what we call it? Scrimshaw. Not sure where the name comes from, but if you haven't been upstairs to the second floor, just a small part of the collection of Scrimshaw that's been given to the Nantucket Historical Association over the last 130 years is on display. Now, the captain has been busy. He has taken his whale stamp and in his log has recorded every whale that they have gotten and how many barrels and casks of oil have come from each. When he's confident that that ship can hold no more oil, he's gonna give the command to raise the red homeward bound flag. One of the first things they're gonna do is blow up the bricks of the triworks. After two or three or four years, the bricks are brittle. If we're going home around Cape Horn, which is what Captain Winslow decided to do, we want no extra weight. So four years later, the Edward Carey returns to Nantucket, and in the middle of the 1800s, that was about standard for a whaling journey. The oil will be downloaded onto the docks and sold. Immediately off the top, the owners and backers will take their cut of the profits. We then have to figure out how much each member of the crew got. Now, whalers did not receive a salary in the sense that we know salaries. They worked on a system called LAY, L-A-Y, and it was based on your, your knowledge and experience. The more knowledge and experience you had, the bigger percentage of the profits you could bargain for at the beginning, but you only got paid at the end of the journey. So young man, for your efforts, you were able to get one four hundredth or $69 for four years. I hope you feel pretty rich, okay? Up the scale to the captain who got over $1,800 for the same four years. As for our friend young Joseph, he had a really good career as a whaler out of New Bedford as well as Nantucket. Unfortunately, in his mid-30s, he tripped on a rope aboard a whale ship fell overboard and drowned. As for the Edward Carey, it made several more trips up until 1864, when the Confederate Navy in the Pacific Ocean gathered together three or four whale ships and burned them all down because what they wanted to do was impact the oil reserves of the North during the war between the states. So by the middle of the 1800s, Whaling started to die on Nantucket, and it was helped along with several factors. First of all, our harbor periodically fills with sand. It did in the 1800s. The hulls of the ships were so deep they could not get over the sandbars, so many of the captains said, hey, we'll go someplace else like New Bedford or Cape Cod, and by this time, New Bedford was on the rail line, so it was much easier to move the oil into the country via rail rather than by ship. Then the Great Fire of 1846 burned a third of the town in Nantucket down, including the whole wharf area. Then the gold rush. Many of the Nantucketers jumped ship in California. By this time, the trip for at least four years they said, hey guys, you know, you go looking for those whales. I'll take my chances looking for gold. And then 1859, something happened in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Oil in the ground. And then the last blow was the Civil War. Some 400 brave Nantucketers went to war. About 70 of them perished. After the war, those that were left on the mainland, if they wanted to whale, might have gone to New Bedford or Cape Cod. New Bedford whaled right up until the 1920s, or maybe they just got another career. So by the middle of the 1800s, whaling was pretty much dead on Nantucket. 
we sat out here on our little island thinking, boy, there's got to be something, you know. What do you do on a little island like this? And when we started to look around, because we were so poor and didn't tear anything down, we had the largest intact seaport in America. And that's when we started thinking, on a lovely day like this, would all of you come out and visit us? And you do, and we really appreciate it, because you're all part of our new economy that we base on tourism. So that's our trip for today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might 